Jewish View. My name is Rabbi Nachman Simon with the Chabados of Delmer, together with my co-host Mark Ronich of Statewide News Service and jbiztechvalley.com. Well, Rabbi, we have for us today, yes. we're going to talk about environmental issues. Peter Aronowitz, he's the Executive Director of the Envi Environmental Advocates of New York State, which is an advocacy and lobbying group. And well, welcome, uh, Peter. Oh, yeah. it's great to be Can here. Can I Thank start you. off with a Jew? This is yes. the Jewish view. Okay. So <laughs> I know environmental, I don't know how, you know, it's been recent, I mean, 20, 30, 40 years that people care about the environment, maybe from mm -hmm. the 1960s. But just in Judaism, which is 3,300 years ago, there's many, many mitzvahs, commandments, Torah enforced commandments of taking care of the environment. You're not allowed to, for example, strip mine. It's against the law just to destroy. You don't destroy trees. Let's just go with a plow. And, you know, if you need it for a field, it's one thing. And you don't just hunt and kill animals for the fun of it. Mm -hmm. and if you need to eat, you need to eat. But that's at least a positive purpose. And this is, I mean, again, it's not just New Age. It's over 3,000 years ago where... You know, it's God's world, ultimately, and it's here to keep it sound. I mean, people need things you need to eat and you need to, to build a house. But on the other hand, just to destroy is, is a really against God's will. So yeah. that's the Jewish view of the environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the environmentalist view is we were formed <laughs> over 45 years ago in 1969 <laughs> with, a, with an idea of being wise stewards of New York's environment and understanding sort of the concept that you were just enumerating sustainability, just not wanton discriminating, you know, tearing down trees or despoiling land or wildlife or fouling the air or water. It's really, you know, for us to inherit for the next generation. Excellent. And Peter, you, were, uh, you took the helm of environmental advocates last year in 2013, mm -hmm. and uh, you served also as an assistant vice president with the American Lung Association. Indeed, yeah. And uh, you had the Healthy Air campaign? That you yeah, had? it was a, a campaign I was running out of Washington, D.C. So I flew every Tuesday morning down from Albany down to Washington, D.C., flew back Thursday nights, and I was leading a campaign that was defending the Clean Air Act against those that would uh, repeal standards or block the Obama administration from moving forward and cleaning up things like power plants and tailpipes. Who would want to do that? Well, you know, there are some vested interests in other parts of this country that uh, would rather see standards to be lower so that they can pollute more into the air, into the water. Um, and my campaign really was about lending voice to people who had lung disease. Their caregivers mm -hmm. uh, met along the way in this country, <coughs> parents who have lost kids to asthma attacks so they had died prematurely to asthma, stimulated their voices and gave a campaign for their voices to be heard in the halls of Congress and in, in Washington, D.C. Well, we're going to come back to the lung issue in a minute because we have a local angle to that that's brewing around Albany County. But you were also the acting commissioner for the State Department of Environmental Conservation. Indeed, yeah. So you got strong creds, deep creds in terms of the uh, environmental well, thanks for saying so. I mean, I've worked outside of government. I've worked inside of government. Mm -hmm. I've done a lot of work here in the state and local level, and I've worked at the national level. So I have a little bit of experience in many different environments. You know, and you were the deputy secretary for the environment under Governor Patterson. Right. There you, I mean, go. you worked on the second floor of the Capitol, and you were personal advisor to the governor. Yeah, I was, yeah. As opposed to being the commissioner, which deals with more regulation and deals with more policy than on a statewide basis, but you were a personal advisor to the governor on the environment. I was, yeah. Yeah. People yeah. don't realize that they that you know, they think the governor appoints the commissioner, so he's the one who's going to advise the governor, but the governor has a personal, has another person who deals with, uh, you know, adv advice and counsel. Yeah, you sort of oversee the agencies, too. You're sort of that um, eyes and ears for the agency, <laughs> and you oversee them, and they report sort of up to you into the governor's office. So that's so, a pretty heady yeah. job. Well, I, I mean, I've had an interesting experience, and, and as you run it through, it just reminds me of the old joke of my family, where you can't keep a job. That's right. Well, they said to me, when people look at my resume, uh, well, w you know, what do you want to do when you grow up? <laughs> when are you going to fi figure out what you want to do when you grow up? Well, this seems good so, for now, right? That's it. <laughs> so at least you'll understand where I'm coming from. Um, you have... Uh, I, mean, I just so, want to say, yeah. the environment, like you say, he has 1969, so it's... Uh, 40 years plus, 45 years, environment has been getting better. I mean, there has been laws and the air quality. I mean, I'm not talking from, I'm the rabbi. I'm just talking from like a commoner again. But it seems to me that things are, you know, there's more laws in place and 
you know, I know the Hudson River was a big issue here when I moved here. You know, it's polluted. Maybe it still is. I don't know how bad it is. It's, but things are getting better, aren't yeah, they? Or, I don't know. You your... say you're not a scientist. You're just a rabbi. But you really yeah. have a good command of the facts. Yeah, air quality has definitely improved in the last 40 years. Um, water quality has gotten better. Is it where you know, though overall the world or you know, nationally? I mean, nationally, you know, worldwide things have improved because the United States is reducing less emissions. Water bodies are, are cleaner than they were in the 1970s. Here, I mean, we still have a need to band together as a society worldwide to yeah. address climate change. Because in I hear China and Japan are really doing a number on the environment. Well, certainly China and India could do a better job of reducing their global footprint in terms of their emissions. But here in this country, yeah. we have fewer unhealthful smog episodes. Soot levels are lower in the air. That means kids with asthma can breathe easier. Seniors aren't dying as often as they were prematurely due to these pollutants. Water bodies are no longer spontaneously catching on fire like the Cayuga River in uh, Cincinnati. So yeah, things have gotten better. Are we there yet? No. We still have to continue to sort of take our medicine and heal the planet. And now you're, we're getting close. you're in the middle of a battle that is similar to that with the oil tankers in Albany County coming along the river, the tracks and the tankers that come along the river. It's just not the city of Albany. It's Water of Lead. It's Cohoes. It's, yeah. you know. It's really a national phenomenon. Well, we they, have, they start from North Dakota, right? these oil tankers. Yeah, so we're doing a huge amount of pumping for oil in this country, and there are constraints on pipelines and ships, so they're now filling up trains, and these trains make their way from the middle part of the country, um, and many of them are showing up in Albany, hundreds of cars per day, where they offload product into barges and ships and float them down the Hudson, or they continue along the rail lines in the Hudson. So communities not only here in New York State, but all across the country, have this new risk of huge amounts of crude oil that's being shipped by train. But you know, then Mark and I have so many shows and different officials, and one person who was in favor of the train said, said Mark asked him, what about the Keystone Pipeline? And they said, oh, it would put us out of business. So would you be for the Keystone Pipeline? This way you would eliminate all these rail cars carrying... I mean, is it better? I well, mean, that's what people say. Well, just build the pipeline and then we won't have to ship it by rail. Right. But the pipeline really is about extracting tar sands oil about Canada and shipping that to the Gulf of Mexico. And even the oil companies themselves say, even with that pipeline built, we're going to ship a lot of oil by rail. It, the name of the game really is, we're pumping oil so fast, we need to get it to market fast. Trains are here now, they're going to move it here. Pipelines may come in the future, that may help, but they're going to use every option. The next question would be alternative energies to eliminate that whole problem. Right. I mean, are you for any of that? I know the, uh, the idea of the uh, fracking is an issue for more energy, natural gas. I mean, is there any better way? I mean, you're not going to stop the factories. I mean, we need the energy, bottom line. That's right. So what's a better way of doing it? And well, what would you advocate for? Yeah, I mean, for us, we really have this false choice to make. Do we continue the dirty, extractive ways of the past, like fracking that has a lot of pollution associated with a lot of emissions, like oil that may spill in our waterways and be impossible to clean up? I mean, we talked about the Hudson River a moment ago. We've spent a lot of money cleaning up the Hudson River, and we'll spend more to clean up the Hudson River. All that could be lost with just one of these barge accidents that leaks a lot of tar sands crude oil. Um, so really what we need to have is a serious discussion about how we're going to generate energy in this state without relying on these just dirty extractive industries. So we need to do a heck of a lot more when it comes to energy efficiency and weatherizing our homes and businesses. We waste a lot of the energy we produce. If we did more of energy efficiency and weatherizing our homes and businesses, we not, not have to have this Hobson's choice of dirty ways. We need to do a lot more about renewable energies like solar and wind technology. Um, the other thing too is what's so alternative about harnessing the energy from the sun? I mean, that's how we did it decades ago and we should do it you know, going forward. So uh, I think the oil industry would like to think, well, that's an alternative to um, extracting fossil fuels. But really, solar and wind is a really smart way to generate electricity. How about geothermal? It's another great example of harnessing the power of the earth to sort of power our homes for heating and cooling. Mm -hmm. a I'm a big market. fan of geothermal, but people seem to, and I have been for 40 years, but this has been one of those things that people say is so far, and they're getting the heat from the core of the earth, and 
you know, they just, it hasn't taken hold. Right, you know. people think of it as exotic or a technology that's not the norm. People are used to going to the gas station, filling up their car with gasoline, and they think this is just standard operating procedure, rather than thinking, maybe the car should be electric, I should plug it into an electric socket. And well, run we have way. a library on New Scotland Avenue that is powered partially with geothermal. Yeah, that's So fantastic. I thought that was pretty again, good. Again, bringing the Judaism again, the Jewish view, uh, to a contemporary, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, who passed away 20 years ago, but it was in our generation, in our times, that he was a very big advocate for solar energy. Mm -hmm. He was an engineer. I'm a rabbi. He's also a rabbi, but he was also an engineer. And he also thought that to harness this energy, he came off very public. And, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, wasn't an in thing. Like, pretty much it's, get, I'm not in, like you say, maybe it should be more in and be more publicized. But still, now it's getting there. You know, people are talking about it. This is way beforehand, and it, you know, you don't know exactly what his mind was. You know, I'm not going to put words in the rabbi's mouth, the head rabbi's mouth. But he, in any case, bottom line, he was an advocate for solar energy. So you can extrapolate yeah. that. He wanted the clean energy, and I mean, maybe a little political that we won't have to depend on foreign governments also. Mm -hmm. So that's not a, you know, that's even a double win. Yeah. You know, if we can produce it cleanly and not depend on everybody else and shipping it, you know, it's not New York State's idea, but shipping these these oil tankers, who knows how many, across an ocean, you know, again, mm -hmm. one accident, that's all you well, need, you know, it's not... Yeah, not Peter's dependent. heading up this uh, Albany County, this uh, effort on, for, for Albany County. I, I don't know exactly what the commission is that the... <laughs> I'm chairing a commission that's looking at all the health and safety issues okay. that are going to um, potentially threaten um, county residents if we start moving in these dirty tar sands oil. Now, I, I look at where the tracks were there first. They're federally regulated tracks. You have a federally funded housing program mm -hmm. right next to the tracks. So, you know, let the, you know if the people don't want to live there, because it's unhealthy, then they let them live somewhere else. The place, uh, Ezra Prentice Apartments, would be empty, and then you can make it. Then that'll send a message to the federal government that you know, gee, you know, this, we have this empty complex like like Love Canal, and people could live in other federally funded housing. Isn't that easy to move from these people? These well, if people you, if, if there's the will, people. you can do it. If there's the political will to do it, you can do it. Oh, but right. the other part is. The other uh, thing is, what about, like the throughway has these noise barriers, what about putting a, a wall up between the apartments and there, so even if there was a fire or if it did derail, at least the wall could mitigate some of the uh, negative impact from the worst of the worst of what it could be. Yeah, the committee that I'm chairing, we pulled together experts and we're going to be announcing more sort of things shortly. But the committee we put together looked at sort of, okay, what does the community want? And we heard resoundingly that they just don't want the trains there. Whether I they're understand, at, but, as but they don't know what... along the rail line. So, you know, we threw together a couple of options. There's a discussion right now about relocating, you know, the personnel, um, I'm sorry, the people who live in the, um, the housing, the residents. Yeah. Um, you know, a wall is sort of certainly, you know, should be considered um, a range of other things. but. Because uh, a wall countywide. could be attractive. I mean, you, I mean, I'm saying a wall could be attractive. You don't have to just put up, you know, a slate walls. I mean, you know, you can have uh, drawings on. You have a contest. You have put drawings on the wall. I mean, there's all sorts of ways of making it look uh, nicer. With you know, just yeah, there you know, are a so range of different options. To, yeah, so. Yeah. The committee that I'm looking at is looking at all the environmental health and safety issues. We're looking at air quality. We're looking at, okay, if one of these tanker spills happens in the western part of the county over the Water Fleet Reservoir, what does that mean for the drinking water supplies? If there's a spill and there's a lot of homes in the area on private wells. So there's a number of health and safety issues. We're going to be working with the sheriff to understand, for first responders, what do we need in the county to respond? And indeed, what's going to happen is that a lot of the counties across New York State where these trains are running through, and they run all across New York State, um, they'll understand from uh, our work here in the county what we need to do to be better prepared, the full range of issues. How long will it take for you to get this? What's the expected time that it would take for you to finish the report? We're sort of on an ongoing sort of process. But you it's know, not going to be forever. Providing recommendations. No, it's not going to be forever. So within a two-year period? Oh, certainly less than that. Less than two years. Yeah. Okay. I so mean, really, we're trying to sort of you know, advise the county executive, and thereby he can sort of work with other state officials, local officials, 
even federal officials about a sort of a, a, a comprehensive game plan. And personally, it. you have a lot of connections in the federal and state, and you know, you can probably help with that effort. Well, I mean, I've tried to sort of use the Rolodex that's been provided me in my life experience and, and use it wisely in this case, you're right. Um, the also, you know, I wanted just to let the viewers know that, you know, in Water Valite, you got this diner that is probably, the, you know, where the tracks are probably the same distance from the diner that you and I are sitting. Mm -hmm. And you had a Stewart's there. I mean, it's Cohoes has, you know, residents there. It's just not the city of Albany. Uh, oh, it's, no, it's, it's the really, whole as I mentioned, anywhere along the rail lines, especially in rail lines in the rural parts of the state or the rural parts of the county where the trains are moving faster, you have a higher sort of, you know, possibility of catastrophic mm -hmm. events. Yeah, because the trains are stopped in the city of Albany. They're not going to derail when they're stopped. Well, and they're moving we've slowly. we've seen through. leaks down there at the port and, you yeah. know, have, there's a lot of fuel at one place, so if something goes wrong, it goes very, very wrong. Um, so that's one of the big concerns about the port or other terminals like the Selkirk rail yards. Who was the brainiac who thought of putting a federally funded housing project right next to these tracks? I, I just know. can't, I, mean, I just can't believe that um, next to the tracks this, or other yeah. housing developments in Albany that are next to 787 where you're breathing a lot of diesel exhaust. I mean, we really have a, a, a poor track record in this country of environmental justice. They probably so. just, uh, there's no money, so they're, who wants to live there? They put the poor people well, in there, what do you think? That's not fair. Um, you do, an in, well, you or environmental planning lobby. Uh, you're right, environmental planning lobby. We have two organizations. Have, right, and they have an environmental scorecard. Yep. Uh, you're still putting that out, but it's not ready yet. Yeah, so what we do is we an environmental planning for? lobby, which was formed 45 years ago, yeah. and sort of you know, be an accountability and a watchdog on New York State's legislature. We put together a scorecard every year where we rank votes that are taken in the Assembly and the Senate and give people a sort of a numeric grade at the end of the legislative session. We're still in the process of tabulating it. We'll put it out just shortly before the elections this fall. Oh, timing is everything. Indeed. <laughs> I want to educate the voters, particularly on where their members are, because I think you, issue. you probably know now where they are, you know, how they voted. I mean, it's not, I mean, you've probably taken these votes along the way, so you probably know now what the impact is. We do have the, the assessment sort of done in the spreadsheets, but that's a long way between that spreadsheet, putting into a report, making it comfortable. We all have the important legislator or champion of the year, and then folks that aren't so great on the environment, we give them an oil stick award. So this is a little bit of deliberation I have to have with my board of directors Th before this we can is, put it out. These are votes or legislation that they initiate? Well, it's legislation that's initiated in some instances, but, but primarily we're ranking them on votes that they take on the floor of the assembly and votes they take in the Senate on key bills. There's about 60 bills where we've ranked people um, on scores. So this one year, you yeah. mean? Yeah, well, we do it every year. Every year we issue our scorecard and where all members of the legislature are on our key environmental issues. We do them on water quality bills, mm -hmm. land impacts, uh, forestry impacts, we do air quality bills. Uh, the range of things that they vote on, we score them on. And you're given positive rankings for um, how good the bill is. So a really great bill would give a three tree ranking for us. Uh, a so-so bill gets one and there's a two tree in between. And on the other side we rank things that are bad for the environment, the number of smokestacks. So really bad is three smokestacks, two, and then one smokestack. So <laughs> it's a little bit elaborate scoring. We want to make sure we get it right, so we allow staff the sort of month of July to crank through it. We give them a little bit of time. And you time publicize in it to the voter? Because, I mean, I'm a voter. Like I say, I'm a rabbi, but I'm just like your well, common you, citizen. You go on their website and you I can mean, see. I mean, you have to, I mean, yeah. it needs publicity to But there are some, there, there are some legislators that consistently get 100%. Right. I mean, they probably... You know, you're, you're probably just tied to them where they call you up and they say, how do you want me to vote on this? Well, <laughs> or you I, have a position paper that you put I don't put think they the, say, they, I don't ask me how you want me to vote. We say this is our position on it. You right. should read our memo and understand our issue so on they it. Know, um, and you if know, you vote the wrong way, you're going to lose points in the scorecard. Well, they but they also that. know there's, you know, a few legislators that say, okay, the, the position paper that we get from environmental advocates is how we're going to vote. And... That's the way, you know, and then there are some on the other side that say the position environmental advocates puts out is the way we're not going to vote, we're going to vote against them. There are some who get very low scores, 15% or something. They, yeah. they get very low scores, and then there's some who get very 100%, you know. Indeed. That's so you, typ typically how it happens every year. You know, yeah. Yeah. and then now you got probably uh, 15, 20 seats that are going to, you know, have new members. Mm -hmm. 
So some of those people who are either retiring or got ousted from office, uh, they're going the empty, empty seats. They're gonna, their scores won't matter, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, it's a uh, new crop of legislators crop. almost every electoral cycle where you can sort of you know educate them during the um, their their campaigns about where so they should. So fracking be. would but you be don't a plus or minus. I mean, what would be that would be a minus. Well, we have a number of bills that we're trying to make fracking better in the state. Yeah. I mean, I think we've. So you're not absolutely against it. It's just maybe tune it up. Well, I mean, you know, right now, I think, and I've spent time at DEC. I mean, I don't think the state could handle fracking right now. So, uh, um, you know, and what we've seen is you need a, a lot better safeguards than what the state's proposed. So, if if the state was going to go forward under their vision of fracking now, we'd oppose it. Mm -hmm. What about the other states? What do you, well, I mean, uh, well, Pennsylvania's done an awful job. Really? Uh, you know, they, they, they went and they drilled first and asked questions later, and they really have done a horrible job about managing the industry. There's been a lot of spills, some catastrophic accidents. You're now seeing health effects showing up with people drinking water that's contaminated. There's a huge air quality issue that's yet to be addressed. I mean, in these communities in New York that are very sleepy and rural right now, they're looking at it as a potential for an economic driver. But what they really need to understand is there's going to be a massive influx of trucks, all diesel powered, that's going to be a huge public health threat. Um, well, not just public really, health, really the roads are that. not built for that's the, another those issue. trucks. And, you're going to, and these county governments will have, I mean, because a lot of them are county roads, the county governments mm -hmm. will have to pay for repaving the roads and, and making them stronger roads, which is going to cost more and yeah. offset whatever benefit they might get, but yeah. you know, again, you talked about the oil tankers coming from North Dakota. The fracking in North Dakota is mm -hmm. really getting, uh, is going, you know, like gangbusters. Right. And uh, you don't hear people dying left and right or being having problems left and right in North Dakota. You can't even, you know, they got zero percent unemployment. <laughs> they got full employment in in that state. Yeah. And I think it's an issue where the science and the, and the research just needs to sort of catch, catch up to that issue. I mean, there's a lot of chemicals being used there. There's a lot of flaring off of the emissions. Um, you know, over time, I, I, I have no doubt that we'll show up the tremendous health effects. We're seeing it in Texas where fracking occurred first. We'll see it elsewhere. Now, you talked about Pennsylvania and the water quality. Is it methane? Is that what you were talking about? Where, where they had in the movie Gasland, I think, they put the uh, lighter to the water and it flared up. Methane is naturally occurring in water. Yeah, I think more it's concerned of the chemicals that are being used in the fracking process, the disposal of the fracking waste, some of which is being disposed in New York State yes. landfills, mm -hmm. um, and what it all means. I mean, you know, there's, there's a, a lot of those issues that are going to be, you know, proven out over time to be significant health effects. So we shouldn't be dumping the fracking waste here in New York? Absolutely not. And there was a bill actually in the legislature that will score um, to prevent hazardous waste from being disposed in New York. So the frackers in Pennsylvania are loading up their waste and dumping it in New York landfills. So it's we're not even fracking here, but we're having a negative impact. It's never slow for your uh, group there. No, it's not. <laughs> it's funny because my colleagues in D.C. said, oh, you're going home to sort of relax and have a quiet life back in Albany. I kind of <laughs> chuckled and I said, no. <laughs> Just the opposite. Yeah. Uh, what about this clean water raid? Yeah. Can you explain that to the? Explain I'll that try. To it's a, a complex one. Yeah. I'll try to boil down minutes. as simple no, as possible. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> you know, the governor is building a new bridge to replace the Tappan Zee Bridge, you know, down across the Hudson in Westchester and Rockland counties, um, and he doesn't have a financing place you know, plan in place. So it's a four billion dollar bridge. He got a loan from the federal government that we need to repay to pay back or to cover 1.6 billion of it. Um, and what he's also proposed is rating a pot of money that's been dedicated for cleaning up New York City's sewage treatment problems, which they're huge. I mean, they're, you're, Columbia University is finding bacteria that are multi-drug resistant in the Hudson River because of the sewage that's coming in into mm -hmm. New York City's waters. So it's a big problem. Um, the city didn't use up all of its funds, so in Albany parlance, let's sweep it uh, and take that half a billion dollars and rather than dedicate it to other water quality cleanup projects across New York State, put it to the bridge. So it's a raid of clean water funds to go to help build the Tappan Zee Bridge. Um, the original ask was for a half a billion dollars. They got the legislature to agree to a quarter of a billion uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, they're going to come back and ask for the second half later. Um, but again, what it is, it's a sort of shows the dysfunction of Albany. Instead of going out and trying to figure out how to spend this money on clean water projects, we'll grab it, rate it, and use it towards a bridge. 
the irony of it all is even if they were successful in the raid, they would still be $2 billion short on building this bridge. And nobody knows where. We've asked for the details. The federal government won't share them with us because New York has said don't share them with people. So what you get is a, uh, a spreadsheet with a big black box written over it so you don't know what's in there. Re it's so, redacted. Yeah. yeah. So it's, you know, the details are very, very scant, yet they're moving ahead with uh, stealing money here, trying to get a loan over there, and cobble together a fiscal plan for a $4 billion bridge. So let me ask you, uh, where this is coming from the Environmental Facilities Corporation? Yeah. It's and a little-known entity. It's an agency here in Albany yeah. that does a lot of financing. It's of like bonding. It's bonding dust. agency, right? Like the Thruway Authority is a bonding agency. Yeah, I mean, the Thruway Authority obviously maintains the Thruway, and then in order well, to do so, they have bonds that are floated that they pay back with the, with the loan. So these dollars originate with the federal government. The Environmental Facilities Corp bundles them together. They issue bonds, um, and they have a revolving loan fund for communities to tap into. And what I'm saying is that, you know, this was the, uh, the, the there are other bonding agencies, dormitory authority, mm -hmm. that maybe the governor is going to tap into to get that extra $2 billion. He just hasn't tapped into it yet. The dormitory authority doesn't just bond for dormitories. I know. I so know. It's <laughs> the biggest bonding entity in the country. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, we've heard you know, in the sort of the rumor mill in Albany that a lot of the state agencies and authorities are being looked at to spare bonding capacity, any loose change in the seat cushions <laughs> to sort of come together to, to uh, finance this plan. I mean, the name of the game really is uh, keep the toll increase as low as possible or delay it until somebody else is in office. But you know that there will be an increase to just be as low as possible. Indeed, there will be an increase. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, you can't build a $4 billion bridge in an authority that lives and dies by toll revenue. They're not getting it from the concessions at the thruway stands um, without a toll increase. Well, you know, when my, you know, I remember Daniel Patrick Moynihan, the U.S. Senator, uh, said in 1985, he said 1986 will be 40 years that the, since the thruway, was it 30 years? That the thruway was having their anniversary, and that's the 30-year bonds would be paid off and then we shouldn't have any more tolls on the New York State Thruway, and he was adamant about not having the Thruway tolls anymore. And the Thruway Authority should have been done away with. But the Thruway Authority came about and said, well, we still got to pave the roads, we got maintenance of the roads, we have other things we need to do for the, you know, with, the, with the money for the Thruway Authority, so we really can justify our existence. And we still have tolls on the Thruway, but the we should have... They should have been eliminated in 1986. Yeah, tolls are going up. We're adding more mm. property, like the canals. New York State Canal right. system yeah. is now part of the thruway. So, yeah. So, are you, uh, do you like the design of the bridge? Is it environmentally friendly? Is it something that you know? Did you have any comments about the? We did, and other groups that worked on that sort of you know tried to get the bridge and the environmental footprint as as best as possible, and they they seem satisfied with it. Um, okay. But the sad part it is they're now saying well. The environmental standards we built into the bridge project now need to be paid for, so therefore we're going to steal these clean water monies to do it. Um, and those groups um, that were part of that process are with us and are objecting to the raid. Um, so essentially what they're saying is the bridge construction is going to create environmental problems, and we need this pot of money to clean them up. Um, but what they're really doing is taking money from another environmental pot to do so. So after they build this new bridge, what happens to the current bridge? Does it just get blown up and fall into the Hudson River? Oh, no. You can't have it fall into the Hudson It's going to be torn down and dismantled, which is why they're asking for uh, half a billion dollars of clean water money. Part of it was earmarked for dis you know, demolishing the old bridge. Well, we always see, you know, on TV, you see the bridges being dynamited and blown up and just falling into Who knows? Maybe waters. we'll film an action movie and half the yeah. bridge will be blown up there. <laughs> Hollywood paid for some of the dis deconstruction. Well, with the, then they're getting tax incentives on top of that. So. Oh, well, don't get us started about environmental <laughs> policy and the, the tangled web it's been woven. <laughs> um, you had one of your uh, big issues is the Child Safe Products Act. Yeah, indeed. We have just a couple of minutes left. I wanted to give you a chance to maybe talk about, what is it, about the chemicals in the fabrics or something? Yeah, well, it's, a, it's a, you know, chemicals that are in products that kids are exposed to, things like high chairs and baby car seats and toys. Um, you know, parents don't know what is in these products. Um, so we thought it would be a good idea to sort of require manufacturers to list them. And if they were on a certain list of chemicals of concern that could cause health impacts like cancer or neurological impairment, 
they wouldn't be allowed to use them. Seems pretty simple on his face, right? We shouldn't be exposing kids and young babies to chemicals that could kill them. Mm -hmm. um, but we are. Um, the bill passed the assembly with overwhelming support, bipartisan support. We had enough state senators signed on to the bill as co-sponsors so that if it was brought up to the floor, it would have passed. But the Senate leadership didn't bring it up to the floor. But it wouldn't harm any businesses in New York State because these products are made in China. Exactly. So, um, but chemical interests lobbied really hard and aggressively against it under the theory of once you start, the next step is chemicals we might like to use and they don't like to be ever told Slippery no. Slippery slope. Indeed. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Peter. That was very enlightening to ourselves. So I hopefully for our viewers that, that uh, continue good work of making a cleaner and better environment for all of us. Yeah, thank great. you very much. Thanks, Thanks for, for having, having me. Appreciate it.